Okay, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Are you all excited to be here? Yeah. I'm excited to have you guys here. You know why we're here? What? We're here to, for story time. We're here to celebrate reading. You know, what was the first command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? To read. To read. Iqra. So we're not here just to celebrate reading. We're here to follow Allah's first command. But I don't want to tell you why reading matters. I want to show you. So if I can ask all the children to actually come closer to over here so you can see the book. Okay. So for all the adults in this room, please find your inner child. Oh, come on. And for the children, continue being awesome children and turn on your listening ears because I'm going to ask questions after and we'll see who was listening carefully. So the book I'm going to be reading is called The Empty Pot by Demi. If you know the story and you know the ending, let's keep it a surprise for those who don't. Okay? And it's always nice to hear a story twice. Or maybe more than twice. Okay. A long time ago in China, Ing, who Everything he planted burst into bloom. Up came flowers, bushes, and even trees, as if by magic. Everyone in the kingdom loved flowers too. They planted them everywhere, and the air smelled like perfume. The emperor loved birds and animals, but flowers most of all, and he tended his own garden every day. But the emperor was very old. He needed to choose a successor to the throne. Who would his successor be? And how would the emperor choose? Because the emperor loved flowers so much, he decided to let the flowers choose. The next day, a proclamation was issued. All the children in the land were to come to the palace. There they would be given special flower seeds by the emperor. Whoever can show me their best in a year's time, he said, will succeed me to the throne. This news created excitement throughout the land. Children from all over the country swarmed to the palace to get their flower seeds. All the parents wanted their children to be chosen emperor, and all the children hoped they would be chosen too. When Ping received his seed from the emperor, he was the happiest child of all. He was sure he could grow the most beautiful flower. Ping filled a flower pot with rich soil. He planted the seed in it, in it very carefully. He watered it every day. He couldn't wait to see it sprout, grow, and blossom into a beautiful flower. Day after day passed, but nothing grew in his pot. Ping was very worried. He put new soil into a bigger pot. Then he transferred the seed into the black soil. Another two months he waited. Still, nothing happened. By and by, the whole year passed. Spring came and all the children put on their best clothes to greet the emperor. They rushed to the palace with their beautiful flowers, eagerly hoping to be chosen. Ping was ashamed of his empty pot. He thought the other children would laugh at him because for once he couldn't get a flower to grow. His clever friend ran by holding a great big plant. Ping! He said, you're not really going to the emperor with an empty pot, are you? Couldn't you grow a great big flower like mine? I've grown lots of flowers better than yours, Pink said. 
It's just this seed that won't grow. Ping's father overheard this and said, You did your best, and your best is good enough to present to the emperor. Holding the empty pot in his hand, Ping went straight away to the palace. <coughs> the emperor was looking at the flowers slowly, one by one. How beautiful all the flowers were, but the emperor was frowning and did not say a word. Finally, he came to Ping. Ping hung his head in shame, expecting to be punished. The emperor asked him, why did you bring me an empty pot? Ping started to cry and replied, I planted the seed you gave me and I watered it every day, but it didn't sprout. I put it in a better pot with better soil, but still it didn't sprout. I, I tended it all year long, but nothing grew. So today I had to bring an empty pot without a flower. It was the best that I could do. When the emperor heard these words, a smile slowly spread over his face and he put his arm around Ping. Then he exclaimed to one and all, I have found him. I have found the one person worthy of being emperor. Where you got your seeds from, I do not know, for the seeds I gave you had all been cooked, so it was impossible for any of them to grow. I admire Ping's great courage to appear before me with the empty truth, and now I will reward him with my entire kingdom and make him emperor of all land. The end. Do you guys like the story? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I have a few questions for you. Three questions to be exact. The first one is, why do you think the emperor was frowning? Because he... Oh, raise your hand. We're going to raise our hand. So the emperor was frowning because he because the seeds that he gave away were cooked and <clears throat> he knew that everyone all the kids that had flowers were lying mm -hmm. nice so he saw the lie inside the flowers huh yeah okay my next question is sometimes others can make you feel small when you're doing the right thing how does Pink feel when he sees him? Who helps him through it? Yes. Um. So, Pink feels kind of like uh, disappointed because um he couldn't grow uh like a flower like uh, his friend mm -hmm. did, and he was disappointed. Be so, yeah. And who helped him through it? Uh, his dad. His dad. Because that's what parents do. They help us through our problems. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. And last question. Can the truth ever be empty? Remember in the last part, what does the emperor say? I admire Ping's great courage to appear before me with the empty truth. Why does the author use the empty truth? Can the truth ever be empty? Yes. So, yeah. so what they mean by like the truth is empty is like when you like when you lie is like full of you know like you know guilt and all like and the truth is like you're you're like ashamed of yourself but you know it's like the right thing mm -hmm. so like it's like empty and clean that like, is clean that's actually one of the most beautiful responses i've heard to that answer did everyone hear that yeah. she said that the, empty, the truth is empty because it's empty from filth, basically. That's what she was saying. All right. So it's pure. Because you know, truth is always, it's full of truth and empty of falsehood. Thank you. I learned something today. <laughs> when the teacher becomes the student. <laughs> okay. 
If you enjoyed that, we have a lot more for you guys. But I'd like to invite my readers up. Who are my readers? So we have three readers with us today. And we have Auntie Rima, who is going to take the four to six year olds to a reading circle. And we have Auntie Lena, who's going to take the seven to nine year olds to a reading circle. And then we have Auntie Aruba for everyone 10 and older to a reading circle plus games and challenges. Okay, so welcome to part two of our presentation. So I hope you enjoyed the read aloud. We wanted to um, show the children why reading matters and the parents, inshallah, just a sneak, view, a sneak preview of how read alouds happen, but we're going to talk a lot more about that today. But we wanted to share a little bit of why we chose the book The Empty Pot for this night. Um, in the story, the flower pots, as the young girl mentioned, were full of lies. And subhanAllah, we live in a time and in an environment where lies are made to be beautiful. But just like the emperor was able to see past the outward beauty of the lie and see the inherent falsehood that existed within, our jobs as parents is to do that for everything we put in our children's hands. So today, inshallah, we're going to discuss why, how to do that, how to choose the best books for your children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he relays the best of stories in the Qur'an. So we know that Allah created us in a way to understand the world and to grow through stories. So not just adults, but children grow through stories. Or I should say, not just children, but adults grow through stories. Stories matter. <laughs> stories matter. And they build who we are, and they shape who we are. So knowing this, about seven years ago, I ventured into storybook writing for children. And I began to build, to want to build worlds for kids through words. Because what you hear, the words that are shared with you as a child, they build your worldview. So as I did this, I joined an organization for children's, uh, in, the, in the children's book industry. I joined this organization and, you know, it's, it collects all authors and illustrators and publishers and agents and it connects them all and networks them all and it's this large industry organization. And five years ago I submitted a manuscript to them and I was invited to one of their industry conferences in LA and I was so excited. <laughs> I was going to meet publishers from, you know, the big five, Random House, Simon Schuster, and all, all that. I was going to meet the editors of Harry Potter. I was going to meet um, Caldecott winners for, Caldecott winners for illustrators and Newbery winning authors. So it was really exciting. And I got there, and I noticed two things. First, I was one of only two visible Muslims among thousands of participants. And every time a Muslim was recognized, every time a Muslim was recognized, you know, as um, the, the children's book world pushing forward into more representation, but every time the representation of a Muslim was recognized, it was always linked with another very, let's say, colorful group. And it almost felt that if this link didn't happen, the recognition wasn't there. That's, that's how much the link was there between the Muslim representation and this other group, this other minority. Second thing I noticed was the whole mission. I mean, they were touting in this conference. They kept saying how everything we decide here, everything we do here will determine publishing for children, not only in America, but the rest of the world because we set the standards. In this room, the people in this room set the standards for the world. And the number one thing that they would repeat about what, how to write a successful story for children, how to write a successful book for children, is that it should make children feel good. 
And this sounds lofty and it sounds noble to make a child feel good because we all want children to feel good. But that's not what life is about. Life is not about feeling good. So they also would teach us through books and uh, they would um, recommend books to us. And this is one of the books that they recommended. I have it right here. It's called Writing Picture Books. I was so excited to read it. I dove in. I started taking notes until I got to this part. Delete any moral or message. Okay, so this is now what, and this is actually not a recent book. This, this book was published a while back. So this has been happening for decades now. But really, morals and messages are being deleted from children's book. But here's the thing. You actually can't delete a message from anything you write. Because once you write something, you're communicating. So a message is being shared. But the morals are gone. So you can't delete a message, but you can delete morals. And you can erase morals. I began to think. I said, oh my god, <laughs> this is what's happening. And you know, if you walk into a library now, five years later, it's no wonder we see a lot of the things we see. But this is a long time in the making. Um, what happened was I realized that of course, it's good for children to see. We want our children to see an outward expression of themselves in the books so that they can identify with the book and build a connection to that book. But what is more important is their moral self, is their inner identity, which is their moral identity. So I started on a hunt for books that would speak to my child's moral mind. And I didn't have to look far because I found other mothers around me and educators doing the same exact thing. So we decided to come together and build something to help parents find, find their child's, uh, find books for their children that build their inner selves. Because a child doesn't need to be a lion or a mouse to understand courage when reading Aesop's fables. And I don't need to be a man to be able to understand and follow the prophetic path. So my outward identity matters more. So we built Mindful Muslim Reader, which is a website and a tool, we'll talk a lot more about that today, to help parents build the moral identity of their children through books. And inshallah with that, we will continue. Thank you, Amira. I'd like to invite Hina Khan Mukhtar to the stage. I'm sure you all know who she is. She's a longtime community member here in the Tri-Valley area. Uh, she's a married mother of three uh, grown young men now, mashallah. And she's one of the founders of the Ilm Tree Homeschooling Cooperative in Lafayette. She teaches language arts to elementary, middle, and high school students. And if that doesn't keep her busy enough, she's always representing our community beautifully in interfaith work. She also writes for various online Muslim blogs like the Muslim Observer and Seekers Guidance. Um, so Hina is going to talk to us tonight about how to raise a reader, how to raise a child who loves reading. So please uh, join me in welcoming Hina. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. So I'm going to take you all back with me about 15 years, and we're going to go back down my memory lane to Ilm Tree, the homeschooling cooperative that Mariam just mentioned. And I was uh, one of the language art teachers at Elm Tree, and I taught all the way from, I started with third grade and I went all the way to eighth grade. I taught all the grades there. But one of the jobs I also had at Elm Tree was to go into the preschool room every day and read picture books for half an hour to the three and four year olds. And there's this one little girl who has always stood out in my mind for the past 15 years. She's in college now, mashallah. And she would be sitting in the preschool circle, and when I would read picture books to the group, I had her full attention. She would be completely focused, 
She wouldn't fidget. She wouldn't make any noise. She would be able to ask, answer very intelligent and deep questions that were asked of the group. She, she would answer intelligently. And she would be able to predict what was going to happen next. She was able to discern what the message of the story was. And that really blew me away because I knew that this little girl, her mother, didn't speak much English. She had only been in the country a few years and she was still learning English. Now, alhamdulillah, she speaks English just fine. But at that time, Eng English was a bit of a challenge for her. So I was really fascinated to know why this little girl was so attached to books and had a good grasp of books. Whereas the other children in the group whose parents were born and raised here, they had a harder time focusing. So I asked her father, and her father told me something very interesting. He said that every single day, he read three picture books to his daughter. He would go to the library, he would pick out books that he chose, or he would pick out books from his own childhood that he remembered enjoying, and he would read her three picture books. And we were seeing the results of that in the classroom, in that preschool circle. And that is something that pretty much every language arts teacher can assess, attest to. I've been teaching language arts now, mashallah, for over three decades. And in the past 30 plus years, me and all the other language arts teachers, we have noticed the same things again and again. We have seen that students who have high levels of vocabulary, students who are able to write complex sentences, students who have a really good grasp of grammar, students who are able to figure out the deeper motivations behind what characters are doing in books, all of these students, what they had in common was that they were avid readers. They were prolific readers and they were being read to at home and they were reading constantly themselves. So in the late 1990s, we saw an uptick here in the United States of America and even around the world, but it started, like Amira mentioned, from the US. And in the late 1990s, the book publishing industry saw a huge, steep, what would we call it, slope go up in book sales. And um, the book publishers were doing really well and books were flying off the shelves. And stores like Borders and Barnes and & Noble were very, very popular in the late 1990s. And social scientists have studied this phenomenon to find out what was happening in the late 1990s to make so many people be attached to books. And they pared it down to three different factors that were happening at that time. The first factor that they give credit to is Oprah Winfrey. They said that Oprah Winfrey, uh, when she started her book club on her show, a lot of kids today, even you know, young adults wouldn't know who Oprah Winfrey is, but at that time she had the most popular daytime talk show, and she was very passionate about books. They say on average she would read three books over a weekend, is what I read about her. And so she would just really passionately discuss books that she really enjoyed, and those books overnight would become bestsellers. Andrew, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, it's either Dubus or Dubu, but An Andre Dubu, who wrote The House of Sand and Fog, he said that Oprah Winfrey single-handedly saved him from poverty. He was, very, he was struggling. He was a struggling writer, nobody knew about his book. She read it, she recommended it on her show, and overnight he became a multi-millionaire best-selling author. The second factor, they say, is in the late 1990s about what made books really popular, is that the world was introduced to a young man named Harry Potter. Harry Potter blew all the theories out of the water. J.K. Rowling created this character, introduced him in 1997. People at that time were saying, no child is going to read a 500 plus page long book. And Harry Potter proved him, uh, proved all those theorists wrong. Ch children were willing to stand in line for hours to buy 500 uh, plus long page books. And the third factor that they saw in the late 1990s is that the internet became very popular and books and articles and magazines were suddenly accessible at the touch of a fingertip, and all of a sudden people had access to books, even in the remotest villages and towns. So what we see from that is that if people show enthusiasm for books the way Oprah Winfrey did, and they're excited about books, it's contagious. 
And if people know that they're not going to be tested and they're not going to be quizzed, they're just going to have discussions about books, they're going to be more willing to pick up a book and read it. I still have peers who will tell me, like when I mention that I love the book Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck, I have a friend who said, oh my god, I hate that book. And I asked her why, and she said, oh, our teacher made us analyze that book to death. And I had to write like three papers about that book. I, I, I just remember hating it. And that's often what happens. A book can be analyzed to death. Most people just want to have discussions and enjoy books. The other thing we saw is that if you have good characters and good stories, people are going to be willing to pick up a book and read it, even if it's more than 500 pages long. And the third thing we saw from the internet is that if books are accessible, people are going to read them, if they're easy to get to. Now, there's a very inexpensive reading kit that I can tell you about that everyone here can have in their own homes so that they can create an environment in which their children are going to want to read. So the reading kit, you just think of the three Bs, the three Bs. The first B is books. Every child should own their own books. Yes, you should go to the library, and yes, it's fine to go to used bookstores, but every child should also have pristine copy of their own book that they can write their name in and that they keep for themselves. And they should have access to books. The second B is book shelves or book baskets. So in their bedrooms, every child should have a book basket next to their bed or a bookshelf in the room in which they can display their books and show them off. And the third B is bed lamp or book lamp. And that was one of the little prizes that the, the kids got for answering questions at getting a, a book light. So at night, all the kids should be told after they've done their prayers and said their orad and read their Quran and they've brushed their teeth and they've gotten into bed, they should have a little book light or a bed light next to their bed, which can allow them to read their books for like maybe another 10, 15 minutes before they have to go to sleep. And what happens with that is that these children then get to associate coziness and comfort and the safety of their home with the environment of reading books. Now, how do you know if you are successfully raising a lifelong reader? Every single student, if that student can answer these three questions you with a with, with a response, then you know that you are raising a reader. The first question you ask is, what is the last book that you read? The second question you ask is, what are you reading right now? And the third question is, what do you want to read next? If the children can answer these questions, you know that you have got a lifelong reader, inshallah. Now, how do we create an environment where children actually want to read? Studies have shown that the primary factor for success for children wanting to read is if they are coming from an environment where reading is being role modeled. So the adults in the home are reading as well, not just the children. And, that, and we're not talking about reading on your laptop or on your phone. Every adult should have a book. There should be a stack of books on your coffee table in your family room that you're making your way through. And your kids, kids should see that you power down your phones, you turn off the TV, and you know, you sit around and you read books. And it's a contagious, uh, contagious feeling to, to want to, it's infectious to want to read when you see people around you reading. And the second thing that kids need to see is they need to see respect and reverence for books. So we should be teaching our children how to handle books, that you don't get them dirty, you don't throw them around, you don't um, put them on the floor, right? And you don't scribble on them, you don't dog ear the pages. Now, what are some of the benefits that we see in children who read avidly? So some of the benefits we see, well, the primary benefit that I see in all my students who are prolific readers is an incredible grasp of a high level of vocabulary. I have a niece who, when she was six or seven years old, her little brother, who's three years old, was doing something naughty. And she looked at him and she said, he is such a rapscallion. And all of us were like, rapscallion? Where did she get the word rapscallion from? And we found out that her mom at that time was reading Huckleberry Finn to her, and that's where she learned that word. I have another friend whose son, she gave him permission to go into a room to get something, and he just turned to her and said, oh, I can just go in there at will? 
who's five years old. I can go in there at will? And she found out that he was reading a book that was a British book, and that's how they spoke, so he picked that up. I have a student I was teaching just the other day, and we came across the word disparage. And I asked him, do you know what disparage, and he's an avid reader, and I said, do you know what disparage means? And he's like, um, doesn't that mean to disdain things? So he responded with another equally high-level word. Um, I had another student who uh, we came across the word dismal in a book, and I asked her, do you know what dismal means? And she said, doesn't that mean dreary? But my, one of my favorite stories, however, is this young girl that I taught last year who was in the fifth grade. And this girl inhales books, inhales them. And one of my biggest challenges of teaching her was finding a book that she hadn't read. And it, it, it actually got very embarrassing. She was in the fifth grade. She had already read Frankenstein. She had already read Pride and Prejudice. It got to the point that she was willing to read a book again just so I could have a chance to read it for the first time, her teacher. So we were reading Johnny Tremaine. And in Johnny Tremaine, it described that the soldiers, they were walking down the road, and they had a gimlet-eyed stare. And I was like, gimlet-eyed stare? I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Let, let me, hold on, let me look that up. And she's like, oh, 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 I know. I was reading a book the other day, and in that book, they, they talked about a gimlet. And a gimlet is a drill that bores holes in metal. So it must mean that they have a piercing stare. <laughs> That's literally what gimlet-eyed meant. OK, so high levels of vocabulary. That's what comes from reading, the primary thing that we see. It also lowers levels of aggression. Studies have shown that, especially in boys. It, it calms them down. It trains children in high levels of focus. We're in an age of distractibility. And with a book, you are sitting there, and you are focused, and you are reading. It teaches kids about the world around them. If a child is sitting there, and he hears his dad and his friend talking, and they're talking about some savvy investor in stocks, and they say, oh, that guy, he has the Midas touch. A kid who has read the book, King Midas and the Golden Touch, will understand what it means if somebody who's investing in stocks has the Midas touch. It means everything they touch turns to gold, right? They do well. So it teaches children about the culture and the world around them. So how do we introduce books to children? This is what I like to do, and I am going to have Mariam Help me out here. So I am still teaching, uh, alhamdulillah, even now. And I also work with preschoolers. And I really enjoy introducing books to preschoolers because it's a whole new world that's being introduced to them. And I start out with, for example, if I had a book like this. This is not a preschool level book. But if I had a book like this, I would start out by going, is this a hard cover or is it a soft cover? And I would also tell them another word for soft cover is paperback. And all the kids would say, hard cover. And then I would ask them, do you know what this is on the, on the book, this thing that I just took off? Most of them will say book cover. But then I'll tell them another word for book cover is dust jacket. And why do you think it's called a dust jacket? Because dust jackets protect the books from dust and also from getting smudges on them. Now, just like you have a name, books have names too. Every book has its own name. And that book is called, that name is called a title. But guess where else the title is? It's not just on the front cover. Oh, by the way, I also tell them, talk to them about front cover and back cover. I tell them about pages, show them the pages and what they're called. Then I talk to them about how every book has a name, and the name is called a title. And then I ask them, do you guys know what you have going down your back. And then we talk about what a spine is. And I tell them, you know, a spine helps us stand up straight. If your spine is straight, you stand up straight. But if your spine is curved, you're going to curve over. And they all kind of practice showing them how they can sit up straight and how they can curve over. I'm like, well, guess what? Every book has a spine also that helps it stand up straight. Do we ever want to put books like this on the ground? No. Why not? Because the spine can break. We don't want to break the spines of our books. Then I also talk to them. And I introduce these concepts gradually over the course of weeks in preschool. Talk to them about who an author is and who an illustrator is. An author is the person who writes the stories. You see the writing on the pages? That's the story. The illustrator is the person who draws the pictures. You know another fancy word for pictures? Illustrations. 
Can the same person be the author and the illustrator? Yes. So that's basically, oh, and then also I, I chose this book in particular because I wanted to show that many picture books will have this sticker on it. Um, if, if you've got quality books in your classroom, they will have this sticker on it. And um, this is the Caldecott Medal. And the Caldecott Medal is the medal given for the best illustrations in a book that year. If it's gold, they were the number place, one place winner. If it's silver, it means an honorable mention. They were close to winning. They didn't win first place, but their illustrations are considered beautiful. And so children are really fascinated with that. And after that, they will be noticing which books have Caldecott medals on them and if they're silver or gold. Thank you. And then the last thing I tell every child from preschool all the way up to high school is that no matter what kind of book you are reading, whether it's a picture book, whether it's a, a detective novel, whether it's science fiction, whether it's a coming of age story, whether it's a memoir, every single book at the end of the day is a mystery. And you are the detective. And the mystery that you are trying to solve is to figure out what is the message in this book that you are being given. And I tell them every single author who writes a book, every single so uh, singer who writes a song, every single movie director, producer who creates a movie, every work of art that's out there, even if it's a painting, the creator of that art has a message that they are wanting to put out in the world. And it is your job to figure out what was the message in this book that I read. And is it a message I agree with? Is it a message I accept? Is it a message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet وسلم, are also giving me? Is it a message that my parents are teaching me at home and want me to take, take in and embody? And if not, what do we do? And letting the kids know that not all books are worth reading, not all messages are the messages you want to absorb. So you have to be a discerning reader, right? Okay, and conclude just this part of the talk. Um, there is an author, uh, a man named Jim Trelease, who he came out with a, a compilation of books and he titled it The Read Aloud Handbook. And every four or five years, he would publish a new version of The Read Aloud Handbook. And from what I have managed to gather from his essays that I have read, I think he's a conservative Christian, though he doesn't say it. But everything he says kind of aligns with the values that we Muslims have, mashallah. And so he talks about the value of reading aloud, and he does mention that there is a difference between a good read aloud and just a good book. Not every good book out there makes for a really good read aloud, and so read alouds have very specific criteria. And what he did was every few years he would release this list of picture books that he thought were worth reading aloud to children, and I loved loved the read aloud handbook. Every four or five years I bought it. I bought old copies. I have every single copy that's ever been published from the 1970s all the way to the 1990s. And he no longer releases those books. I think he's too elderly now. He has a website. But anyway, a few years ago we were talking about it and I was telling Amira about this man named Jim Trelease who's kind of done the work for us and has picked out some really good picture books that we can safely, you know, read to our children. And Amira at that time said, you know, we need something like that for Muslims. We need somebody who's reading books from the Islamic perspective through the Muslim lens and knows whether, you know, this book is worth reading to our children or not. And she's like, somebody needs to create it. And I was like, yeah, somebody needs to create it. And that is exactly what these young women have done, mashallah, these four young women. They've, they've been working on it for the past few years. And I'm incredibly proud of them. And I'm so excited to be able to be part of their journey in, in helping them promote uh, you know, mindful reading for Muslims. And so um, before I conclude, I wanted to just go through some really quick tips about do's and don'ts of read aloud. Are we okay on time? Okay. So um, you want to introduce the title, the author, and illustrator every single time you read a book to your child. You want to remember that your attitude towards the book matters. If you are bored with the book, don't read it. 
Okay, read books that you enjoy reading because your enthusiasm is going to show. Especially in the preschool age, look for rhythm and rhyme. As a parent, you are going to get bored of reading books that are repetitive with rhythm and rhyme. My husband used to hate reading The Little Engine That Could. But I think I can, I think I can, but every night we would read, I think I can, I think I can, because our kids loved it. And the message in that book was what? That you can persevere, right? You have to have grit, and you, you can do it if you think you can do it, inshallah. You want to look for simple images. Um, again, this is, we're talking about preschool uh, level books. Simple images, not a lot going on. Um, simple sentences and words. As they get older, it's going to get more sophisticated. You want to create a routine around reading. So for every family, it's going to be different. For some people, it'll be like maybe the father reads to the children while the mom is getting dinner on the table. Or maybe the mom reads to the kids when they're in bed, right before they fall asleep. But there should be some routine to reading, OK, so that the kids can look forward to it. And you want to be patient uh, when you see that your kids are fidgeting and know that they're going to come around, inshallah, they're going to get it. In the, in the beginning, it is hard for kids to concentrate, but they get it over time. You want to read above children's intellectual levels because what studies have shown is that they can't read above their intellectual levels, but they can listen above their intellectual levels. So they can listen to sophisticated vocabulary and uh, more complicated grammar. However, you don't want to read above their emotional levels. I personally, in Islamic picture books, I love the books that talk about the five senses, that how Allah gave me ears with which I can hear, and then talking about all the different things you can hear, and Allah gave me eyes with which I can see. In the early years, you just want to teach kids about the wonder of the world and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behind it all, right? But many of us jump into like teaching them about the kuffar and the battles and the, you know, and the jihads, and it's just, you know, it can be a lot for children. So you want to avoid long descriptive passages. Um, if you're reading a novel, you want to end on a suspenseful part and end at a cliffhanger so that the kids are eager to continue reading the next day. You want to make it cozy. You can have hot chocolate and blankets. You can read in front of the fireplace. Again, kids, you want them to associate positive feelings with being read to. Let them take their time to look at the pages. If they don't want you to turn the page because they really want to inspect the illustrations, let them. Be expressive. Your tone matters. Um, if it's a suspenseful part, start whispering. If it's an exciting part, start speaking louder. Do different voices for the different characters. And then have a discussion at the end about what was the message of the book. Is that, that was all? Is that oh. <laughs> OK, take your time. Don't rush through the book. Um, let them, OK, if you've got fidgety readers who have a hard time sitting there, let their hands be busy. Give them paper, give them crayons, let them draw. They will still be listening. And they will occasionally look up to see you know, the pictures on your book, and that's fine. You'll be surprised how much they're taking in. Reading aloud is a wonderful time to bond for fathers and their children. It's an excellent, excellent way for dads to bond with their kids. My husband, he read uh, a, the, the Iliad. He read a version of the Iliad with my boys and taught them Greek mythology. And it took a long, it took like a year to get through all those stories. Um, Aesop's fables, which teach beautiful messages and morals. So um, it's a great time. And then the kids remember it when they're older. You want to definitely limit their screen time. Um, after you're done reading a really great book, like Sarah Plain and Tall, for example, in third grade, you can watch the movie of it as a family, because it's a clean movie. And it's done pretty much true to the book. Um, but at, but otherwise, avoid you know cartoons and 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 movies and all that. Stick to books for entertainment and invest in that time. Oh, and don't use reading aloud as a bribe or a punishment. Don't tell your kids if you don't finish dinner, I'm not going to read to you tonight. But uh, reading books should not be linked to anything else except that it's your routine and you do it with your children, right? And that, that's it. OK. So I hope that was helpful. And inshallah, I think you're going to really enjoy the rest of uh, their presentation, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you so much, Hina. Inshallah, we can implement these lessons with our children at home. So Hina talked about how to raise a reader, how to raise a child who loves reading. 
But now we're going to take a look at what they should be reading. We know that reading is crucial to our children. It's crucial to their education and their upbringing. But what they're reading matters. We want the best books in the hands of every Muslim child. We want books worth reading in the hands of our children because words matter. Words build our children's worldview. It matters what they're reading. So let's take a quick look at what's out there right now. Um, so the first book is called The Hinna Wars. It's a Muslim protagonist, a Muslim girl on the cover. It's about Hinna. Uh, it's about a school competition, Hinna competition, Mahindi. The author is a Muslim, okay, visible Muslim. This is the author you'd see her if you open the inside, of, inside cover. But what you might not know if this book was in your child's hand is that the protagonist is this. I don't know if there's younger kids in the room, but she comes out to her Muslim family and then pursues a romance with a non-Muslim girl. Okay, this is a, this is a top selling book uh, marketed to young adults. They call it YA, young adults. That doesn't mean adults who are young. It, it means children, the, like young teens. Okay, the next book, Salma, the Syrian Chef, a beautiful picture book uh, marketed to young children about a Syrian refugee. She misses her grandmother and wants to make her fool recipe, fava bean recipe, and she cooks with the different members of her family. But then we get to this page, and she's cooking with her two uncles. But when you read uh, underneath the picture, it's very clear that these two men are in a romantic relationship. This is a picture book for young children. Then you have, on the other hand, you have, you have um, authors like this. So New York Times bestselling author, Terry Brooks, he's written classics, good, clean books, um, like this, The Sword of Shinar. So this was actually on Ilm Tree's um, reading list, I think, several years ago. It's a clean book, it's a good book, the more, it has a message, it has a moral, it's about finding truth. But fast forward a few decades and he comes out with a book like this, a sci-fi dystopian novel, and the main character falls in love with a humanoid, a robot, um, who was created, her purpose, um, creation, she was a pleasure synth, that's what she's called, a synthetic being, a pleasure synthetic being, um, for the purpose of providing pleasure to rich men. This, again, this is a YA book, young adult, marketed to young children. These are not books worth reading. These are not the books we want in our children's hands. So at Mindful Muslim Reader, we ask ourselves questions, and we spend a lot of time thinking about what makes a book worth reading. Is this how I want my child to speak? That's, that's one of the questions we ask, because we rate our books on our website for language. And this is the question we're asking when we give the rating. Is this how I want my child to speak? Amazon best-selling book, okay? with words like this. Do we want this in our child's hands? Or do we want a book like this, written by the poet laureate of the United States, Amanda Gorman, a, a young black woman, the youngest ever poet uh, laureate who was appointed by the president, with words like this. The next question, is this how I want my child to act? So there's books like this, again, another, I pulled these all from the Amazon bestseller lists. Books like this, or do we want in the hands of our children, books like this, the one Amira read earlier this evening, that teaches children about honesty, even when it's difficult. And the last question, and probably the most important, is this how I want my child to think? Because in the end of the day, our beliefs, what's, what's in our hearts, are going to inform our actions and inform the way we live and inform our akhira. So is this how I want my child to think? So there's books like this, very popular. I'm sure you guys have all seen it. This is going to be on the shelves in your children's classrooms in most schools. Or 
you can have books like this, 10 Beautiful Things. It's about uh, a young child traveling across the country with her grandmother, and the grandmother challenges her to find beauty in the world, even though she's faced a tragedy. So is this how I want my child to think? Those are the questions we spend a lot of time thinking about when we recommend books. So a few days ago, someone forwarded me this um, Instagram post um, from an organization called We Are Teachers that represents about 3 million teachers. All reading counts, graphic novels, that's comic books, magazines read aloud, movie captions, a back of the serial box, all reading counts. We disagree with this, okay? We disagree with this. All reading, if, if, all, if all of this reading is equal and it all counts, that means there's, there's no value in elevating a child through what they're reading. There's no value in elevating their language or their morality or the messages that they're getting. So we disagree with this. And, I, and we're going to do a little exercise. We're going to rewrite this Instagram post. <laughs> so if this was a, Amira, mashallah, spends a lot of time making beautiful Instagram posts. So follow us on Instagram if you don't already. Um, this is what we would post. This reading counts. Reading that builds language, that elevates the language of our children. Reading that fortifies their moral character. And most importantly, reading books that increases their understanding of the truth. Those are books worth reading. This is what we want in the hands of our children. So our, one of our, our mission at Mindful Muslim Reader is to elevate young Muslim readers one book at a time. Um, we read every book cover to cover so parents don't have to. Um, we rate them um, and then we, we put them on our site. So I'd like to invite Arusa up to show us Mindful Muslim Reader. My name is Arusa, and I'm also part of the Mindful Muslim Reader team. Why am I here? Well, when my children were really young, I spent countless hours asking around for book recommendations, poring over Amazon reviews, and searching endlessly through websites for high caliber books, books that mirrored Islamic values. And it turns out, as you can see from the panel up here, that I wasn't alone. With that, after years of reading, sifting, searching, discussions, and planning, I'm excited to share with you a site that we've developed uh, for all of you, our community, in mind. We pray that this tool enables parents and educators to quickly find recommendations for books which build character, teach virtue, and instill in children a morality that inshallah will develop or help develop their Islamic worldview. Before I get started, can I see a show of hands if before tonight you had actually heard of Mindful Muslim Reader? Okay, of those that are raising their hand and raise them high, because I, I just want to get a sense of the room, um, have you, uh, did you know that we had a website? Okay, and of those that are still raising their hands, did you go to our website? Okay, okay, alhamdulillah, that's good. Um, with that, let's get started. So at Mindful Muslim Reader, you'll find over 200 book recommendations at the moment with many, many more on the way, spanning all ages and genres. Each of these books on our site have been read cover to cover using our rigorous review process and rating process that we took years to develop. Let me begin by showing you how we've classified our recommendations. At the top of our homepage, you'll see books by values, struggles, age, and genre. Let's we'll start with books by values. So as parents and educators, say you're looking for a specific book to teach a child the value of service, whether it's service in the home, it's service in the neighborhood, it's service to the community. You can actually look, uh, with, uh, sorry, without expectation, and this is the big one, without expectation for anything in return. And you could select service and find books that actually help build that um, value in your, ch in your child or in the child that you're reading to. 
Or you find yourself wanting to build in a child an appreciation and respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creations and, and the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. You could select reverence. Perhaps you're looking for books beautifully highlighting a prophetic example in a male role model, such as providing for the family, working hard, protecting women and children, controlling anger and being the most gentle and kind to members of his family you would select manhood. Or you find yourself in need of books that beautifully show strong female role models, nurturing and working hard to raise, um, to, to uh, nurture the people in their family, or to, I guess, uh, yes, uh, help, help with the family, showing mercy and being graceful. You would select womanhood. In addition to those values, we have values such as courage, patience, humility, generosity, and gratitude. Now we've also grouped books by struggles. And to understand uh, what we mean by struggles, I'd like to give an example. As we know, children learn through stories. Perhaps you've seen your child, a child in your care, struggling with social interactions at school. They need help understanding the consequences of intimidation or discrimination. You would select bullying. Or you see that a child is making choices that they normally wouldn't, only to fit in. Then you would select peer pressure. Maybe you just want an opportunity to teach your child or a child what to look for in friendship and why choosing the right friends is important. You would then select friendship. Of course, we have other struggles here. Take, for instance, boredom, something we all know children struggle with. We need to be able to teach children that it's okay to be bored. They don't always have to be entertained, despite the nature of our society today. In fact, we need to teach them it's okay to be quiet, to be still, to reflect. And you would use books uh, under boredom. Perhaps, um, actually, I'll go to the next one. So we also categorize books by age. Now we have uh, books for 0 to 4, 4 to 7, all the way to 15 plus. This is really helpful if you have an avid reader and you want to ensure that there's appropriate content in their hands, free from modern ideologies. You could look for books this way. We keep things, themes and language in mind when uh, grouping books by age. We have um, also grouped books by genre. Pretty standard, but I wanted to call one to mind, uh, one to your attention, specifically biographical. Today, children are bombarded with images and messaging from pop culture icons and social media influencers that can build a damaging worldview. Here you can find biographies of real life heroes that direct our ch children's hearts and minds towards admirable character traits and ideas worth learning. In addition to these four categories, we also have book lists. S uh, sorry, hold on. Audiobooks. So at the beginning, at the top of our book list, we have audiobooks. And there's a fantastic way of building listening comprehension and reading skills. But reading skills start by listening, by learning the vocabulary, by listening vocabulary. So they can be fantastic for car rides, but they can also be great to listen to while doing chores, doing Legos, or working on art projects, something that I have my kids do. We also have book lists for books that'll appeal to, uh, to girls and books that'll appeal to boys. Calling to attention our gold star list. This is a great list to find the absolute best of our recommendations, books that elevate the standards and understanding of virtue in an engaging and beautiful way. We also have a list of read-alouds, uh, Empty Pot of which was, uh, is on that uh, list, which provide for excellent discussions while and after reading of a book. And we also have just added a new list called teaching tools. So many of our books on our site right now have discussion points related to the book that you can find, and I'll, I'll show you in just a minute. Going back to our home page, at the top right now, you hit find a book, and it takes you to our book list. And in our book list, you can actually filter, so go ahead, next slide. You can filter by the same categories, uh, categories that I just talked to you about, age, genre, um, values, and struggles. Once you find a book, you can actually take a deeper look. So let's take a look at Empty Pot right now. 
in the book that she just read. And you'll see that at the top, there's tags related to the very values and struggles that we just talked about, but all the values and struggles found in this book. In addition to that, you'll see the synopsis of the book. You'll find the synopsis of the book. And ratings. As we read cover to cover, we rate for virtue, story, language, and beauty. A little bit lower, next slide, you'll see this um, button here, it's called yellow flags. This is where we flag any questionable content that may be found. In the book, The Empty Pot, there was actually, it's really hard to see from where you were, but there was an image of, of a child not fully dressed, so we called it out here. But of course, for books um, with more, um, uh, with things that we have to be more careful of or mindful of, we list them out here and it would be a fairly lengthy list. The thing is, books, even if they have yellow flags, they're still books worth reading. And that's why we have them on our site. Further down, we have something called a mindful review. So this is just a review that helps you understand why we chose this book. So in addition to the synopsis, why we chose this book and how you can use this book, or why we find this book to be of value to your child. And then further down are the teaching tools that I had just talked about. Even further, um, down you have our affiliate link. So if it's a book that you want to gift or you want to purchase, uh, clicking on one of those buttons, whether it's Amazon or Bookshop, and we try to use Muslim uh, bookstores when we can, um, helps support this platform. Now, our site is not just for younger children. Our site is actually, uh, can be used for older children as well. So when I talk to you about the age groups, there's a 15 plus uh, section as well. So if we go to the Malcolm X book that's there, it's a very famous, well-known autobiography of Malcolm X. I wanted to show you why this book could be an excellent read aloud opportunity for your child. And I, I meant that, what I said, a read aloud for a 15 plus uh, child. They're not children anymore, they're young adults. But having said that, they serve as excellent ways to be able to have deep and meaningful conversations um, or discussions. So here's uh, one uh, teaching tool I wanted to point out that you can find on our site. The word Islam means submission, submission to God. Malcolm says, the hardest test I ever faced in my life was praying, bending my knees to pray, that act. Well, that took me a week. You know what my life had been. Picking a lock to rob someone's house was the only way my knees had ever been bent before. I had to force myself to bend my knees, and waves of shame and embarrassment would force me back up. For evil to bend its knees, admitting its guilt, to implore the forgiveness of God is the hardest thing in the world. Discuss how Malcolm's climb out of the state of depravity began once he submitted. This is an example of one of the teaching tools that you can find on our book. And this is also an example of why reading aloud to even 15 plus year old young adults is so crucial as they're out there in the world learning ideologies from the world around them. Where do you want them to learn these ideologies? In the home with you or out there? Things that you have to think about. Beyond our book list, we have a space where you read, uh, where we have blog posts on how to nurture a reader in our home, and we have extended book reviews. We pray that this platform serves as a useful tool in providing easy access to books which nurture our children's worldview one book at a time. I hope, inshallah, you have a sense now of the type of books you'll find on our site. Still, I want to give you peace of mind of the types of book you will not find on our site. Books that uh, show atheism, disrespect towards parents, elders, tradition, and authority. Books that showcase or highlight scientism, the non-binary view of gender, moral relativism, and individualism. With that, I'd like to invite Aruba to come speak. Assalamu alaikum. Um, so my name is Aruba. I'm part of the Mindful Muslim Reader team. And, you know, first and foremost, as we wrap up the evening, I'd like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
for bringing us here and may he accept every action we do and shower this entire venture with his blessings. Um, we are really honored that MCC invited us here today and we are especially thankful to Hina for coming and sharing her wisdom with us. Mashal, I'm sure you guys all benefited. Every time I hear her, I definitely benefit. But above all, thank you to all of you for making time on this busy Friday evening to come here and to listen to us. Um, if you liked what you heard, um, there's still a chance to subscribe to our newsletter before you leave. And as you're leaving, I would like to ask that please keep these words in mind. Read, read, and then read some more. Just read for yourself. Of course, read to your child. But, you know, just read sitting next to your child. You're reading, they're reading. It's, and read beautiful books. As Mariam said, the books build our child's worldview. So read books that build the values that we all cherish, right? Patience or respect for elders, faith. And with that, I'd like to open the floor for a Q&A, if anyone has any questions. We have our first question here. Okay. Salaam alaikum. Um, Jazakallah khair for putting this together. Um, how can we support it outside of, you know, the website and everything, you know, can donations, like how does that work? Just, you know, and I think this is just not for just Muslim children, but all children, providing them access to this. Um, and like it said up here, that Abrahamic tradition, it's a lot of folks that need this, but just, just wanting to support um, above and beyond, you know, so, you know, going to the website and getting those books, how can we support? Thank you for that. So um, on the website, we have, um, Shala, yes, to build this up, we need community support, honestly. Um, and uh, we have a support us on the website. If you go to the bottom of the website, uh, you can support um, financially. And um, if you purchase books through our affiliate links, we also get, you know, it's pretty small, but <laughs> it's something. <laughs> but, um, and duas, really, that's the, the big support and getting the word out. Um, those are some ways to support us, yeah. Um, yeah, and we'd actually love to, so this is our second um, community event. We did a, another one last month at the San Ramon Masjid service, and we're doing another one next month at SBIA in the South Bay. But if you have a community, if you're not from the MCC community, um, and you have a community that you um, think we can do our presentation and that would be beneficial, uh, please reach out to us. You can use the contact us form on the website. And um, uh, alhamdulillah, we've been getting requests, so we'll, we'll try to honor them because we really do want um, more than just people using our site, people to start thinking about what's in the hands of their children. Thank you guys. This is wonderful and it's a great resource. A uh, couple of questions. Number one, is, my wife Sarah know about know about this, right? She does. Yeah. She she's one of the she's like at the soul of this. Are you kidding me? Is she really? <laughs> okay, because she didn't tell me about this, but okay. So, but my second question is, how did you pick the the young books for young men? Because, like, I'm sitting here. There's no way I could recommend a book for to girls or to women. Cause I just wouldn't know a thing about it, right? But so for men, how did you pick young, you know, 15 and over, which is my crew, how did you select those books? That's an excellent question. Um, I would say that we used, to our best knowledge, um, the prophetic example of what manhood is and tried to emulate, tried to see books with characters that emulate the prophetic version of manhood. Um, it would be nice to eventually have children, older boys, <laughs> kind of vet our books. But a lot of our books are actually read by children. And we do um, talk to them, say, hey, what do you think of that book? Especially when reading story. Because as an adult, we can find a story very engaging, but you need to know from a child's perspective as well. But uh, that's, I would say, what we use to... <laughs> <laughs> of course. We also cons we, we look to the men around us, I guess. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah, 
Our, ch- our children are a litmus test. Yeah, our, ch- our children and Elm Tree are a litmus test, I would say. Yeah, that's true. All right. Uh, I have a question. What if, what if, like, a kid reads a book, like, Captain Underpants? Like, I've read that book, and I'm not really, like, what what that book is really about. What would happen? What what would be your what would be your opinion on what what the person something? should read? Yeah. Next. Do you want to answer? I want you to answer. Yeah. That's actually a really good question. Um, the best analogy is is that people like to eat junk food, right, and candy, and it's not going to affect you just overnight. But is it good to have a steady diet of junk food? What, what the ladies up here are promoting is like the best of the best quality food. It's, it's the food that's going to make you healthy, that's going to make you grow tall, grow better. That's, that's what these books provide you. They're going to give you good vocabulary. They're gonna, you're going to think about it for a long time. And the messages in them, Captain Underpants, it, it just goes in and out. It's not going to stay with you forever as far as like wanting to inspire you. But there's books out there that when you read them, they're going to change the way you look at the world. Mm-hmm. And inshallah, the books on this website, many of them, and there's more out there that they're still going through and get, and sifting through, that inshallah are going to sharpen your ability to see the world around you. But you're right. One book here and there, it's not, you know. We should. Uh, also, what if, like, the book got, like, a... Uh, like metal but like is like not exactly what you would really want to happen in a masjid or anywhere really that's a good question so this question is what if a book wins an award but it it's not a book we would want our children to read is that yeah that happens a lot actually and especially i would say in the past 10 years there's a lot of books that are award winners, bestsellers, that are absolutely not anything I would put. Like Judy Bloom. Like yeah, that's a really, really good point. So, yeah, we have um, the true award is the one that gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, eventually, the best seal to find on a book is a mindful Muslim reader seal. That's, that's the biggest award, <laughs> inshallah, one day. <laughs> And on that point, I do want to say that one of the goals of Mindful Muslim Reader is, you know, when I was at this conference, um, I was attending, they had a mixer at one point, and uh, I did not find my place there. It was, you know, it was all alcohol and all those things. So I kind of left it. And I went and I found this really lovely group of elderly women sitting together. And they had their tags on. I was like, so what are you guys, you know? I was like, are you writers, illustrators? Like, they're like, no, we're reviewers. I was like, oh, what's that? I mean, I know there are book reviewers, but I was like, I didn't realize it was something that the publishing world listens to, and they actually invite them to these conferences because they're going to inform what goes into school libraries. They're going to inform what gets um, promoted for educational purposes. And I said, wow, you know, alhamdulillah, they were, they, were, they were a really beautiful group of people. But the publishing industry listens to reviewers. And we don't have, as Muslims, a single official organization that reviews not Muslim books, but just the entire canon of English literature for Muslim kids. So this, inshallah, is one step towards building that voice for the Muslim community in the publishing world. Yes. You know, one of my du'as is that, inshallah, and Allah can make anything happen, but one of my du'as is that we reach a point where if a book doesn't get put on the Mindful Muslim Reader website or doesn't get their stamp of approval, that publishers and authors will ask, okay, what do we need to do to get you to include it on your list? What do we need to take out? Just, just tell us the one thing that's going to you know, give us your thumbs up. And inshallah, that can happen. It, it does happen. And, and there, there are communities where restaurants will ser- serve halal meat because they know that that's the way you get people to come to the restaurant. 
So the same can happen with books as well. And one point, uh, I'm sorry that I, I forgot to say in my talk um, that I wanted to say right now, in case there's people out there who are not doing this, please normalize giving books as gifts to children. When babies are born, I don't. I personally don't give uh, clothes. I don't give toys. Clothes get outgrown. Toys break. Books are gifts that keep on giving. They they don't break usually. Um, children, even if they quote unquote outgrow them, if they love the book, they're going to want to hold on to it for their own children. It, they get passed down to younger children to siblings. So books literally they keep on giving. They, they're very valued and. You know, books are, are, are worth a lot. I, I still remember one birthday party I went to where people were giving these huge, like, you know, the, the child was opening his gifts and the toys were really, like, huge and lit up and they looked fancy. But I personally knew that that toy didn't cost more than, like, $15, $20. And then there was this one lady who came to the birthday party and she's like, I'm so embarrassed. Like, people are giving all these big grand gifts and I just have this one book that I'm giving the child. And uh, the child opened it up, and it was this beautiful pop-up version of Alice in Wonderland. I was fascinated. And I noted down the name and the publisher because I wanted to get it for myself. It was a $40 book, right? But it's, it's like books have value. We shouldn't be ashamed of, of showing up with one book to a birthday party. People will appreciate them. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, there you can. MashaAllah, this is really amazing. Um, one idea, and maybe I don't know you're working on it, is maybe to create a watch out list because a lot of our kids go to the public library or there are many families that have kids that still go to public school um, and they can just kind of search this book like, is this okay? You know, um, And sometimes we do flip through the books, but we may or may not catch it. Um, I'm. I'm not sure if that's something that you're looking into creating, but that would be pretty amazing. Um, but I love this initiative, and may Allah bless it, and put tons of barakah in it. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Thank you. That's actually an excellent question, and I think that's the question we get most. Um, where's your reject list? We want that. So yes, our reject list for every book we've put in, we've probably rejected 10. Um, so it's much bigger. For now, what our focus is to recommend books because we don't want, we want to say what we're about, but not what we're not about, essentially, for now. Um, eventually, with time, once we've, you know, in a few years, inshallah, and once we grow our team and we get more readers, and because four is not enough, <laughs> there's a lot of books out there, um, whatever isn't on our website is the reject list, but not yet. Definitely not yet. We're nowhere near that, but we will get there. But uh, one hack I do have for you from mother to mother. Um, I taught my kids how to read the publishing date when I'm at the library because I have a few kids. And when I go to the library, they'd come. I, I have a rule where I, you can't read a book. And you, can't op you can't read a book until I've okayed it, especially for the older kids. Um, but even picture books now, right? So I, they, the pile next to me was just getting really high and I can't get through it fast enough. So when we were doing this project, we realized that you'd actually notice themes every decade. The envelope gets pushed a little more and you'd notice themes in every decade of what was happening in the world of children. And if you want to stay away from certain ideologies, like more, the, more of the modern stuff, especially after the huge push for diversity and things like that, which had its benefits but also has its drawbacks, uh, teach them to read the publishing date. Very easy. It's like a hunt. Anything for me published before 2010, you have to bring it to me and I have to approve it. Anything before, I know it's going to be free of certain things. If you want a book free of disrespect for elders, I would say go 1980s, the cutoff, right? 90s, you start getting that a lot. Um, and usually, <laughs> 50s and 60s and 70s, they're pretty, they're, they would be considered classics. So, uh, so they're usually fine. Assalamu alaikum. Um, so you kind of like answered part of uh, at least one of my questions. I, I am the mom of an avid reader and I find myself struggling uh, in the library and I'm glad um, to know now about the mindful Muslim reader because to be honest, I, 
Um, what I've been using so far is the Christian uh, websites. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of like helped me weed through, you know, the books. And um, so my first question is, so now you have about 200 um, books reviews. So how, like, do you have a goal as to how many reviews you're going to be having at, like after a year or something? Because I like my daughter, she literally like, like eats books. So it's really hard, you know. And then um, what I lately what I've been doing is kind of like gearing myself or her towards um, old book, kind of like classics. So is that kind of like I, I heard kind of like just before you said that's kind of like a safe, yeah. safer bet in general, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, generally we found that the classics, um, and we've kind of defined that as books published before 1970, because we're already into 2023, um, tend to be pretty safe of the ideologies that are on this slide. Uh, they're, they're pretty safe from these specific ideologies. There's other things, but um, how old is your child? Oh, she, 12, yeah. Some of the things that may be problematic, like theology-wise, that would be over her head anyways. Um, one of the things we recommend for avid readers is to look for series, book series that are clean. Um, that's a feature we are about to launch, actually. So if you subscribe to our newsletter, you'll find out when we launch the feature. You can search by series. Um, and that's that's a feature we added specifically for parents of avid readers, because then instead of handing them one book, you can hand them five and say, like, hopefully this takes care of you for, for a small amount of time. Um, so inshallah, look out for that feature, the, the search by series. Um, yeah, we, we have a goal. We're, we're training readers uh, right now. Uh, so that we can add uh, more books, um, inshallah, to our website. Um, specific number, not not quite yet, but inshallah, make da for us. Hopefully a thousand. <laughs> but that's not going to Aim high. Uh, I, I have a question that, like, I'm wondering about if my book is good right now for my age. So I'm, like, reading in school right now Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and I'm wondering if that's a good book. And like, <laughs> I love the I love the Harry Potter series. I read it as an adult. So when it came out, I was young, but I didn't get into it until I think my freshman year of college. My my cousin um, was reading it, who's also an adult, <laughs> who's also in college. So Harry Potter, we consider that it's not on our site, but we consider that dessert. It's not junk food. Might not be broccoli, but it's like a good bowl of ice cream. It's pretty clean. Um, how old are you? Uh, nine. Nine. So what I did for my, I let my my um, my kids read Harry Potter, but I, I let them read, read the first three books when they were young. Um, the older books have some things that I wanted to wait them to wait to read. So I let them read that when they were like 11, 12. Um, yeah. So read the first three and then hold on for the, like, the last So four. you're saying as I continue to age, I could start reading and then I find... You have to ask your parents. <laughs> But that's what I did for my child. If you're if, is your parent in the room, yeah. Yeah, um, a nice way to frame it is, you know, when you're at the airport, who carries the bags? Your baba or your mama? <laughs> and would a five-year-old carry the bags that a 20-year-old man can carry? No. So there's just like there are heavy things in this world physically heavy things that an adult can carry, but a child doesn't. There are heavy things that your heart and mind, they're still developing, and they're gonna develop, inshallah, into a wise, intelligent adult. But they'll be able to carry things that right now, if you carry it, it'll hurt you. And so I always tell my kids, if the world unpacks something like that on you, go to your mama or baba, they'll help you carry it. Uh, last question? Yeah, I think we have five minutes to Isha, so we'll make this the last question, inshallah. Uh, is Quit a good book? Yeah. Any Duke? So we just got a submission for a review. We will review it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you want to recommend a book, I think they can speak you. If you want to recommend a book, you can go to our website and there's a section there. So if it's something that you have read or you're curious about, there's a section there where you can um, submit a, a book uh, recommendation or request.
we're going to wrap it up and announce the book raffle winner, inshallah. Okay, so I'm going to read the email out. Naima at gmail.com. Oh, Nudge, Nudge Mia. You gave, gave it to the half blind person. Nudge Mia, congratulations. You've won a book basket, inshallah. Mashallah. Yeah. Hmm? One of the three B's. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, we'd like to end with a dua. Um, can we invite Brother Mahdi up to the stage to end with dua? Bismillah, <laughs> alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma. Oh Allah, teach us what will help us and help us with what you teach us and increase us in knowledge. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa razuqna attiba'ah wa arina al-baatila baatila wa razuqna ajtinaabah. Oh Allah, show us that what's true as true and help us follow it. And show us what's false as false and protect us from it. Oh Allah, we ask you to give us clarity in this time of increasing confusion to give us wisdom, to pour wisdom in us, Ya Allah. We ask you to give victory to the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu We ask you to give victory to help us pray at night and stand at night, Ya Allah. We ask you to help us fast for you and give for you and live for you and breathe for you and love for you and only get angry for you and not angry for ourselves. Ya Allah, we ask you to surround us with truth and beauty and, and elegance, and we ask you to give us victory over our egos and victory over, over our own selves. We ask you, Ya Allah, for all of those teachers and scholars and, and workers and strivers that are striving to make La ilaha illallah elevated and beautiful and help humanity, give them victory, Ya Allah, by your power, Kun Fayakun. It's easy for you, Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla. Wa anta tajara hazna idha shi'ta sahlan sahla. Oh Allah, nothing is easy except what you make easy, and you can make the difficult easy, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we turn to you. We don't rely on ourselves. Fathbutu wadhkuru. Ya Allah, we're taking the efforts, but victory comes from you. Wa la yansuranna Allahu man yansuruh. Ya Allah, you give victory to those who give victory to you. Ya Allah, these mothers have worked ten thousands of hours, Ya Allah, day and night. Ya Allah, give them victory. Give them vast victory that crosses continents and oceans and homes and hearts, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, inna Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you from the beginning and we don't rely on ourselves, we rely on you. We entrust our affairs to you. We depend and lean on you. And we and there's no escape from you except to you. Ya Allah, protect our children, protect our offspring, protect our progeny. Ya Allah, protect our schools and our institutions. Ya Allah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka min al-khayri kullihi ajilihi wa ajilihi ma'alimna minhu ma'alam na'alam. Wa na'udhu bika min al-sharri kullihi ajilihi wa ajilihi ma'alimna minhu ma'alam na'alam. Oh Allah, make us all min al-awliya al-su'ada. Make us from your, your awliya that are happy. Ameen. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillah wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen inna allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammadin al-fatih lima ughliq wal khatim lima sabaq na صر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم صلاة تنجينا بها من جميع الأهوال والآفات وتقضلنا بها جميع الحاجات وتطهرنا بها من جميع السيئات وترفعنا بها عندك أعلى الدرجات وتبلغنا بها أقصى الغايات من جميع الخيرات في الحياة وبعد الممات الفاتحة one last round of applause for a mindful Muslim reader. <laughs>